you, thank you. You guys, please sit. Nobody, nobody shares the love like Church by the Glades. Nobody. So you guys are awesome. It's always a privilege to be here, and uh, we just we love this church. We're always so thankful when we get to come back, Lori and I. We love your pastor, David and Lisa. I have a lot of acquaintances, have a pretty big circle of friends, but I have only a few close friends in my life, and Pastor David is one of those, and I know his wife uh, is one of those for um, my wife, Lori, so we love you guys a lot, very grateful for you, and love this church and this ministry. I hope you know how blessed you are to have leaders that have integrity and courage and character to keep doing the right thing, even in really difficult circumstances. So it's an honor to be here, and uh, we're about to wear out our welcome. Um, we were here uh, last week as well because uh, my wife Lori and I, uh, let's see, a week ago on Sunday before Hurricane Ian came through, we kept seeing all the hurricane stuff on the news, and Lori was supposed to speak at a conference in Orlando, and we're like, well, surely they're going to cancel the conference. There's a hurricane. Monday rolls around. Their conference is still going. We're like, well, you know, we committed to do it. So on Monday, we basically flew into the hurricane, hello, to speak at this conference. But she's supposed to speak Tuesday night at 7. And at this point, they've said they're canceling the rest of the conference, but we're going to run it through Tuesday night, okay? About 80%, 90% of everybody has gone home. But we can't leave because Lori's speaking. And I'm standing at the hotel Tuesday afternoon, and they start sandbagging the doors of the hotel. I am like, we have got to get out of here, you know? Like, So we're having all these conversations, like, do we shelter at the hotel in Orlando? but then can I still get back to do our church services on the weekend and all these kind of, and everybody that we were with, all these people that uh, were at this conference were like, we're going north. You got to go north, man. You're going to Atlanta. They're going to Nashville to try to fly out. We're going to go north. But I, I had an unfair advantage because I have a friend that has lived here his whole life, Pastor David Hughes. So I got on the phone and I said, David, like, what do you think? He goes, well, listen, Judd, everybody's going to be going north. And there's not going to be any gas if you go north. You just got to be ready for that. And there's not going to be hotel rooms if you go north. Everything's going to be picked over. He goes, if it was me, I said, if it was you, what would you do? He says, if it was me, I would drive south into the storm. <laughs> I'm like, I know we're friends and all, but you're going to have to explain yourself. He says, look, you'll, you'll have plenty of gas will be available. All the traffic's going the other way. If you come up the eastern coast, the, the hurricane's coming in on the west. Like, you'll just be on the outer bands of it by, like, uh, Thursday so, uh, or Tuesday night. So, you'll, you know, you'll be all right. And then you can get down closer to Miami where the airport will either stay open or open as soon as practical. If any of them are going to stay open, it'll be that way. So he's like, I would just come south. So everybody there, when the conference was over, was going north. But I said, I trust my friend. So we headed south. Now let me tell you, I live in a place that gets four inches of rain a year. And I have never in my life experienced rain at the level that we experienced. I know it was just the outer band, right? It was nothing. But I'm telling y'all, man, like, I've never driven where my windshield wipers are maxing out. Like, I didn't, I'm like, they're like maxing out and you can't see anything and people have their hazards on and everybody's going like 40 miles an hour and I'm hydroplaning and I'm trying to see. And Lori's like, do we pull over? I'm like, no, we don't pull over. You know, like, we're going, man. We're in the middle of a, it's a hurricane. We're not stuck. Stopping. And so we're like driving, and at one point, I'm trying to see in front of me, the windshield wipers are, flat, are going as fast as they can go, and I cannot see, and I start doing that, I take my glasses off. <laughs> and my wife, Lori's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm trying to see. <laughs> it felt like I just needed to remove some layers, you know, like. And then I told her, like, turn the, turn the car light on. She's like, it's night outside. I'm not, so I said, turn the car light on. She turned the car light on. She's like, I said, I think that helps. I think I can, I think I'm seeing better with the interior light on and my glasses off. Anyway, it was crazy. Then we get this alert. Did you get this alert uh, when, the, when the hurricane was coming through? The emergency alert. We're driving down the freeway and it says suddenly, like, warning in this area till 745. Take shelter now in a basement or an interior room. Do you guys have basements? I'm like, they don't have basements here, do they? What's going on? 
And then it says, Lori reads this to me as I'm driving. You know, if you're outdoors in a mobile home or in a vehicle, move to the closest substantial shelter and protect yourself from flying debris. Check media. Now, look, I grew up, and so did Lori. We grew up in like Tornado Alley in uh, Texas. And so I tornado warning, I'm not too freaked out. You know, I'm like, it's a tornado. We'll probably be fine unless we're not, and it'll be over quick. So, you know, like, I'm like, we're just going to keep going, you know, like, and, but Lori's like, we got to pull over. We got to pull over right now. I mean, all of a sudden, she starts imagining, like, cows flying across the freeway. Have you ever seen the movie Twister? You know, like, like her mind just went there. And she goes, look, well, I got a place right here. I got a place. I said, what? You know, I said, let me see. She holds her phone up. And I'm like, what is that? It's a motel. You found a motel in dark nowhere, Florida. Basically, she wanted to take me to Bates Motel. That's what was going on. I'm like... Look, man, people go there to die. I'm not getting off the freeway to go to that motel. I am taking my chances with the tornado. So we finally get down close to Miami, and we're so exhausted and worn out. And thankfully, Pastor David and his wife were like, look, you guys just come to our house and get out of this crazy storm. And so we showed up last week at their house, and they were nice enough to, to uh, give us a place to crash. And, uh, and then, you know, we said goodbye, and now this week we're like, we're back. So they can't really get rid of us. But here's the thing. Like, I had an unfair advantage. I had friends that were trying to get out that literally were running out of gas, couldn't find a hotel room. It was crazy. But I had an unfair advantage because I knew somebody who was connected and who knew what to do. And not only that, who gave me shelter and gave us a place to stay. I want to suggest to you today... That as a person of faith, you do have an unfair advantage. That you know somebody who's got some connections in your life. That, that God, the God that you serve, is powerful and strong and bigger than the challenges you're facing and bigger than the obstacles and bigger than the problems and that you actually have access to him and that you have an unfair advantage. Now, it doesn't mean you won't struggle in life. It doesn't mean we won't face difficulties and hardships. It's not like God's Will Smith playing Aladdin and you just sort of rub the lamp and you get a wish. It's not that, but it's that we are in a relationship with a God who does love us and will walk with us and will help us, even in a world where evil exists and pain exists and difficulty exists. The way we access that unfair advantage in a very practical way is through prayer. A prayer is just honest communication with God. But here's the thing is, I've known a lot of people that have even been believers sometimes for many years who are still kind of weirded out by prayer. They're not really sure like how to pray, what to pray. They're not, you don't want to do it wrong and they don't feel worthy and they're not sure God, you know, like they don't really know kind of how to approach it, how to handle it. Even Jesus' disciples, they're walking along one day. His like core people, they say, Jesus, like teach us how to pray. It's like they had seen him do it and they're like, we want to do that, but, but we're not sure exactly how to do that. Like, teach us how to pray. And so Jesus teaches them how to pray in what's famously become known as like the most famous prayer in the Bible. It's known as the Lord's Prayer, which is kind of interesting. It probably should be known as the Disciples' Prayer, because if you really want to know the Lord's Prayer, go over to John chapter 17, and, and uh, you know, you'll see Jesus praying for multiple chapters. But in Luke chapter 5, you know, he's teaching the disciples how to pray. So this is really a model more than just something that we should repeat by rote. It's a model to give us insight into how to pray, teach us to pray. So here's what Jesus says in response to that question, Lord, teach us to pray. He says, you should pray like this. Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 9. We'll get to the highlighted word. Say it real loud here with me. He says, our what? Father. Our Father in heaven. Now, that's, that's, a big, that's a big statement. We're going to come back to that. Our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Brennan Manning says that when Jesus says Father here, it's an Aramaic term, Abba, that he uses, that this term, that he was the first religious leader in history that Brennan Manning was aware of to ever say that we should address God as Abba. Wow. And the reason that's so significant is because Abba was like the very first term that Jewish kids would say in the culture in their time because it just meant daddy, yeah. you know, dada. And so the very first word kids would speak in Jesus' culture at the time, Jesus says, when you pray, say, our Abba, our Dada, our Father, who art in heaven. 
Hallowed be your name. He's still holy, righteous, powerful, just, strong, but he is our father. And Manning says, you look through all the religious writers, the Jewish teachers, others throughout history, nobody said you should come to God that casually and address him as data. But Jesus says, when you pray, pray like this. Our father, our Abba, the first word a Jewish kid would have learned in that culture. Our Abba who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Which tells me, you don't have to be worried and concerned when it comes to prayer. You don't have to be like afraid that you might do it wrong because if God is your Abba, if he's your data, then you can't really do it wrong. You can't mess it up. You don't have to worry about having the right words. There's no like special formula. You can just come to God and it's honest communication with God. But I want you to think about this. The Bible also says you have not because you ask not. And some of us today may be in a place in our lives where we could experience more of that unfair advantage if we would get more intentional about prayer and bringing our needs and requests to God and asking him to move and work in our lives. So I want to share with you three ways that prayer unlocks your unfair advantage. And the first is this, that prayer positions you for provision. Provision. Now, my daughter's in college right now. She's a senior in college. I'm really proud of her. She's like working two jobs and keeping scholarships going, and she's doing great. And uh, when she was in high school, she would always ask me for money. Every time she was coming around the corner, every time she called, I knew it was, hey, parent, film me here. I knew I knew it was coming, right? It was the money ask. But one of the things I've noticed in college now is, is I will sometimes check on her bank account, and she will be like college broke. You know what I'm talking about? Like, like there's two bucks in the checking account, like barely enough to keep it open, you know? And, and, uh, and so I know that she's waiting to get paid, right? She's not gassing her car up. She's, she's on the cafeteria food plan, but she's not getting, there's no Taco Bell runs happening. You know what I'm saying? Like, she is broke. What's surprising to me is she often no more, she won't ask me for money anymore. Like she'll just tough it out. And I I told her, I said, Emma, look, you're in college right now. You're working hard. You're trying to keep these scholarships going. You're working jobs. Like I want to help you. I want you to ask me so that I know what your needs are so that I can help you in your life. I want to be able to do that for you. Now you're kind of offending me because you're not asking me. I do. And then I started thinking one day, like, how much more our Heavenly Father, who loves us and cares for us and has access to all things, how, I mean, how much more does he want us to ask him for the things that we need, to ask him to move and work in our life? I think he wants, I mean, the first thing that happens when Adam and Eve are created in the Garden of Eden, it says, God bless them. He blessed them, like he's the God that blesses. You look at the book of Genesis, the word bless is used in that book more than any other book in the Bible. And I often think it's kind of like God is introducing himself in the first book of the Bible as a God that loves to bless his people. It doesn't mean we won't go through difficult things, hard things, challenging things, but I think God's disposition is to bless his people and walk with his people. That's kind of the God that he is. And so Jesus says when it comes to prayer, this is how you pray. He says, our Father, our Abba, who are in heaven. And then Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 11, he says to pray this way. Give us this day our daily what? Bread. Our daily bread. Give us our daily bread. And bread is a, is a very broad term. You know, it, it certainly refers to food, but it also can refer to everything that you need in your life. Shelter, love, purpose, meaning, communication, like God can provide. And it is okay for you to ask God to provide the needs that you have in your life. I think he loves it when you do, and I think he wants to meet those needs. Let me talk about some myths that we often wrestle with when it comes to asking God for things in our lives. The first myth is is this, that we think prayer is for professionals. What I mean by that is we often think that prayer is stuff that the pastors do, the pros, you know, like you're the, the religious people. I, in Vegas, you know, I have people come up, people, hustlers and all, they come up to me all the time, like, hey, pastor, pastor, hey, man, they'll see me out on the street. Hey, 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 man, we pray for me, bro. You pray for me. It's like they want me to like rub my rabbit's foot in my pocket and work the pastor mojo, you know, like, and and bring the blessing. I'm putting it all on six. Will you pray for me, man, before I, you know, like, like somehow I have this special, 
I got the special connection that nobody else has. And yes, the Bible says the prayer of a righteous person is, you know, is effective. But listen, the Bible also teaches that Christ died for you and for me. And we are both the same at the foot of the cross. And God hears your prayers because he loves you. And your prayers are just as valid as my prayers. And I, like, you don't need a pastor to pray for you for it to be legit. You can go to God yourself and he will hear and move and work. And he's invited you to come to him and bring your needs. Now, I know that the pastors here at Church by the Glades, I know they love to pray for you. It's an honor to pray for you. But listen, it's not like they have the special connection that you don't have. You have a direct connection to God through prayer. Here's another myth that we, we often think prayer needs to be significant. Like things going on in the Ukraine or, you know, things that happened last week with the hurricane. And like, like I can't pray about the little things in my life because it's gotta be significant, right? Because the world has big problems, and it does. One of my favorite stories in the Old Testament is uh, 2 Kings chapter six. Um, it's a story where Elisha's standing there. Uh, he's a big time prophet of God, and this guy's chopping down a tree. And as he's chopping down this tree, the ax head that he's using flies off the ax and flies into the water. And the guy's really distraught. He's like, oh man, I borrowed that. It wasn't mine, I don't know what I'm gonna do. And it's just a dumb ax head. But Elisha takes this stick and does what the Bible calls the miracle of the ax head. And he, he throws a stick in the water. And, and then all of a sudden, the text says, the ax head did swim. And it comes up to the top of the water. And he tells the guy, grab it. And he grabs it. It's a whole story in the Bible. I'm like, why is this even here? What is this about? Like, just get in a chariot and go to the Jerusalem Home Depot and get an ax head. Who cares, right? But what I kind of, the more I think about that story, like, what I love about it is that's sort of the point. It's just an insignificant ax head, but it wasn't so insignificant that God couldn't do a miracle to help his children out in that moment. Sometimes, like, God is so big that I think no prayer request is too small. You know, so we could pray for little things, small things, things that may seem insignificant to others. But if it's significant to you, you are God's child. You can bring that to God. It doesn't have to be. Yes, there's the big global things. Yes, there's huge things. But you're praying about something small doesn't negate those things. All right, they're still there. And God can still move. Here's my third. The third myth is this, that prayer doesn't produce. That prayer doesn't produce. And I admit Prayer is mysterious, right? Haven't we all prayed for things that didn't happen? Yeah. Haven't we all prayed for people and been so disappointed when God didn't show up and move in the way that we prayed for? There's, there's a mystery here because often God won't do the things that we think he should do or think he ought to do or wish he would have done. So we can step back and start thinking, well, you know, prayer doesn't even work, man. I prayed about that situation, I still lost my job. I prayed that my family member would get healed, they still died of cancer. I prayed that this crisis wouldn't happen, it still happened, radically impacted our lives and our family. So what's the point of prayer? But I wanna to suggest to you today that, that prayer does produce, that God does answer prayer. Even throughout the Bible, he just doesn't always do it on our timetable and in a way that we can always understand. But I wanna suggest that God, if he won't change the situation, he will often change your heart. If he won't give you the strength to push through the situation, then he'll often open a door where you can navigate around a situation. Sometimes the greatest way God answers a prayer in our life is by keeping a door closed that we're praying he'll open. <laughs> Come on, aren't you glad? Have you ever looked back over your life and thought, thank God he didn't answer those prayers? <laughs> I don't know what I was asking for back then. God, just make her please love. And then like 20 years later, you're like, thank you, God, for not asking. I don't know, thank, she, thank you for not answering that prayer. That would have been a disaster. Look at her on Facebook. Wow, that was, this, is, this would not have gone well, right, or the other way. And come on, you know what I'm talking about. Anyway. Like, thank you, God. That was mercy. I just didn't see it. That was grace. I just couldn't see it. I believe God works, and he moves, and he responds, and it's a mystery, but my challenge to you is to feel empowered, because Jesus says, come to God, call him Abba, bring your stuff to him, 
It's okay to pray that God will bless your business. It's okay to pray that God would open up new sales for you in your life. It's okay to pray if you're a realtor that that sale goes through. It's okay to pray that God would would supernaturally show off. Sometimes I'll pray, God, come on, man, show off. I just need you to show off a little bit. Just, you know, just, just show off. It's okay. I'll give you the praise. I'll give you. And it's sometimes he does, and he blows me away. And sometimes he doesn't. But I'm still going to pray that he will show up and he'll move. And here's what I found. If you will begin to pray about your daily needs, about the things that you're carrying in your heart, you will find that your blood pressure begins to decrease, that the weight on your shoulders is less because you don't have to carry all of that on your own. You keep giving that to God and praying that he'll move and he'll show up and he'll work. You bring him your needs and lay them before him and say, God, I need your help. Jesus invites us. Look, prayer positions you for God's provision. Here's another thought. Prayer positions you for God's power. Positions you for power. Uh, I remember years ago, uh, I did something that I was really embarrassed by. Um, I was really stressed. I was about to leave town the next morning. I was in the laundry room trying to get laundry done so I could get packed. And Lori, my wife, had gone to the grocery store. We had a couple little kids. Um, my daughter had gotten up like multiple times and the third time I heard her little feet get out of bed again and I just was losing my mind, right? There was just too much going on. I'm like, I cannot deal with this right now. And I just reared back and punched a hole in the laundry room wall. I know. And I remember standing there and I'm looking at it and I'm like, oh, well done, Pastor Judd. Real spiritually mature. You just punched a hole in the laundry room. And now, my second thought was like, I can't let my wife Lori see this. I got to hide this somehow. You know, so I remember I took a broom because it was in kind of an, I turned it up, you know, upside. And I tried to like lean it up over the hole and, you know, kind of make move some things around. And I thought she probably won't see it. And then I'll go out of town. When as soon as I get back, I'll, I'll fix this and she'll never know. And would you believe, man, she got home from the grocery store. We're unloading groceries. And you know it. She walked right into the laundry room. And I'm sort of standing there. And she comes walking right out. She goes, why is there a hole in the laundry room wall? Everything in me wanted to lie, right? I remember looking at her and I'm like, well, because my wife's like never loses her cool. She's so composed. Her dad was an engineer. Like this is her dad happy. This is her dad sad. This is her dad. Like, you know, so I had to tell her like, well, you know, your husband, the pastor lost his cool and punched a hole in the laundry room wall. And she raised her eyebrow. My very next thing I said, promise me you won't tell anyone. She raised her eyebrow a little more. Shortly after, I was talking about temptation, and uh, I was working on a message. It was on Saturday night, and I just sensed God was telling me, like, you know, this is an interesting message, Jeb, because you're not talking about yourself at all. (laughs) It's like everything everybody else is wrestling with, but you need to talk about the fact that anger and impatience are real temptations in your life, and you just punched a hole in the laundry room wall. And I remember sitting there, and I'm like, I'm not talking about that. Like, God, I love you, but I'm not doing it. You know, you come into church on Saturday or Sunday, and for us it was a Saturday night service, first service, and everybody's singing, God, we love you, we praise you, we give you my whole heart. You ever been in that moment? God, I give you my whole heart, I give you everything, and all I hear is like, laundry room wall, laundry room wall. I'm like, no, I don't give you that. That's mine. You don't get to have that. I'm not doing it. I get up, I'm giving the message, and it's totally tanking. Like, everybody's bored. I'm bored. It's bad, right? I know. God is not, God is just like, all right, I'll just sort of remove the blessing, you know, and you can just, you can just uh, flounder out there on your own for a while if you like. And so about halfway through, I finally said, all right, all right, I just sort of caved, and I, I just told the church, you know, look, I, I need to tell you about, one of, about temptation in my own life and something I'm struggling with. And here's the thing. I've struggled with anger and impatience my whole life. And I went through a season where I felt like I really had victory. You know, like God had delivered me from that. But what I've found is when you're stressed out or vulnerable or tired, sometimes the temptation areas that we once had victory in in our lives can come back around 20 years later, 30 years later. It doesn't mean you don't love God. It doesn't mean you are committed to him. It doesn't mean he isn't working in your life. It's just, I think, the struggle some of us are going to have throughout our lives, and that certainly is one of mine. But here's what happened. When I told the church about kind of what I had done, and um, uh, at the end of that service, I remember there was like 50 guys lined up to talk to me. And the first of all, the guys came up, and they're like, man, Judd, you're a rookie. Like, all you got to do is hang a picture over that hole. (laughs) 
And then they would never know. Like, I've been doing this for years, man. I punched, like, the holes in the hallway, all the things, and I just hang up. <laughs> Good to know. But the next thing I heard from so many guys in our church was like, you know what? If, if you will be real and honest, I'll be real. And there's something that happens when we get honest with ourselves and honest with God. And you don't need to be honest with everybody, but like in that sense, tell everybody all your, all your stuff. But it's powerful if you have somebody in your life that you can be really honest with and transparent with. Because we all face temptation. You can be tempted in a lot of different ways, but we all face temptation. And so Jesus tells us not only can we ask for provision, but we can ask for power in the midst of temptation. Look at what he says, Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 13. He says, and do not lead us into what? Into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. The Bible says that Jesus was tempted in every way like we are, but he did not sin. So he is a resource that we can go to and pray to. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning in verse 13, says that, that we're tempted um, uh, you know, in every way like other people. I know we often think we're unique and we're special when it comes to temptation. The Bible says you know, we're tempted in ways like other people, but that God will always give us a way out. He will give us a way to stand in the midst of the temptation. So that means we're invited to pray when we're tempted and when we're struggling. Listen, when you're leaving church and somebody cuts you off and you start wanting to wave at them without all your fingers, you can stop and cry out to God for help and for strength in that moment, in the moment of temptation. When your kids come in and you made this whole meal for them and they're not hungry, but then an hour later they want a snack, you can pray that God would supernaturally show up up and help you um, not to injure them in that, in that moment, those children that you love. Look, man, you know, when, when you're frustrated with somebody in your life or in your family, when, when you're carrying bitterness and hate in your heart, you can pray that God would help you in those moments and help you with temptation. And I believe he wants to. He can provide a way out. And even when he provides a way out and we don't take it, we can still come back to him again and again and pray for his help, pray for his strength. Psalm 50, God says, call on me in the day of trouble and I will rescue. God says, call on me in the day of trouble and I will rescue you. And so that's what we do when we cry out in the midst of temptation. Here's the third area that prayer can help position us, give us an unfair advantage. Prayer positions you for freedom positions you for freedom. I saw this on social media. Um, I thought it was pretty funny, particularly right after a phone call that I'd had. One guy says this, the way you say speak to representative to the automated phone system is the real you. <laughs> I had just been on the phone in an automated system uh, with a company that shall not be named UPS. And um, I'm on the phone, and I mean, I am stuck in automated phone purgatory, y'all. This is just going to, and the voice is really real. Like, it's not the computer voice anymore. It's like they're almost human, you know, and, and uh, the voice, is, the lady kept saying to me, I know you want to speak to a real person because I was losing my lunch, you know. I know you want to speak to reals, but I need you to enter your tracking number, which I had entered like five times. And every time I would enter, the, they would, she would say, I'm sorry, I didn't get that. And then I'm like, you know, help me, do something. I know you want to speak to a real person, but, you know, and finally by the end, I'm like, speak to a representative, speak to a representative, speak to, I'm like, short survey, short survey, short survey. How do I get to the short survey? Because I got a long survey for you. <laughs> Look, if you live long enough, somebody's going to hurt you, somebody's going to frustrate you, and the temptation is going to be to start carrying around more and more hurt and more and more bitterness in our heart and in our lives. Several years ago, I went to a counselor and I was uh, really burning out. I was tired. I was exhausted. And I wasn't sure kind of what was happening. And um, this counselor really specialized in working with leaders and, and uh, people that sort of navigated uh, a lot of leadership kinds of decisions and weight. And one of the things the counselor said to me is, he said, look, I think you have carried a lot of little wounds for 20 years that you've never really healed from. And so you added one more little over the next little, over the next little, the stuff that you don't really think about. And you just carry that. And he said, pretty soon it's not about the pace that you're running at. 
It's about the weight that you're carrying at the pace that you're running. And he said, what, what I think will bring healing for you in your life is to go through a process of trying to forgive all of these little wounds that you've been carrying around in your backpack. And he made me go through a process. First of all, he said, I want you to list out all the people that have hurt you like over 30 years of ministry. I'm like, bro, <laughs> it's gonna be a long list. You ready for this? He says, this week, this is your homework. Go write out all the people that have ever hurt you in ministry. I'm like, okay. So I sat down and I start thinking. Now his whole, this is the qualification. They have to really hurt you. Like not just somebody who's a little gossip or whatever, like, like people that betrayed you, hurt you over the years. I said, okay, okay. I sat down and I started getting my list ready and the you know, first name was quick, boom. Second name, boom. Third name, boom, 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 boom. I got to about 10 and then I couldn't really think of anybody else. I remember sitting there and I was looking at this list and I'm like, there's more, man. There's gotta be more. It's, like it's not long enough, right? I couldn't, all week long I tried, I could not really bring my, there was not another name to really add to the list. And I went back to this counselor and I said, look, man, you told me to make a list of all the people that had hurt me in ministry over 30 years. And I thought the list would be two pages long, 150 names. And I can only think of, of 10 people. And he looked at me and he said, Judd, it's always only 10 people or six or three or two. But he said, what we tend to do, it's human nature, is we start projecting out from the 10 to everybody else. And we start feeling like we can't trust other people because everyone will hurt us. When he said, the truth for many of us is, most people have been good to us. Most people have been kind to us. Most people have been faithful to us. And we focus on the few that haven't. And we project that onto everything. So he says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go through a process over the next several weeks of trying to forgive the people that have hurt you. Now, here's the thing about forgiveness. Forgiveness doesn't mean that the thing didn't happen. Forgiveness doesn't mean that those people shouldn't face uh, situations and consequences for the things that they did. Forgiveness doesn't mean that the law shouldn't be involved. Forgiveness doesn't mean that people shouldn't face criminal consequences for certain things that they did. Forgiveness means that I let go of my personal kind of vengeance that I'm holding in my heart and I turn them over to God and I say, God, you have to carry this because if I carry it, it's going to kill me. The weight is too much. I can't carry it anymore. It'll take the joy out of your life, the smile out of your life. It'll leave you at a place where you start not trusting everyone because you've been hurt by someone or by a few. So Jesus says this, Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 12. Forgive us our debts, he says we should pray, as we forgive our debtors. Forgiveness is powerful because it can lead to our freedom. And then he goes on in verse 14, after the Lord's prayer, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly father will also what? Forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. A strong statement. And I think Jesus is implying, look, salvation is by grace through faith. And we simply come to God and he extends his grace and his goodness to us. But as we're forgiven and as we grow over the years, our hearts should be growing towards forgiveness and not away from it. Letting go of some of those hurts and wounds and releasing people and finding that's where the freedom really is. And then Jesus closes out this Matthew prayer. Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 13, he says, we wrap it up this way, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. What? Amen. Amen means like, it is true. It's an affirmation. And it's such a cool thing because God, so Jesus starts and he says, we come to God and we call him Abba. And then we bring our needs to him. 
bread. We pray, we, call, we pray for power in temptation. We, we, we forgive and release others and we experience God's forgiveness in our own heart and in our own life. And in the midst of all of that, when we come to the end of the prayer, the model prayer, again, it's not simply to be memorized and just repeated. It's just a framework for us. The model prayer reminds us that at the end, we start with our Father, but we end remembering His is the kingdom and His is the power and His is the glory forever and ever. It is true. Even Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane before he went to the cross prayed that God would move and work and that he wouldn't have to endure what he would have to endure. And in the midst of this prayer, he says, but not my will, your will be done. And when you look through the Bible, it reminds us who God is. The Bible says God's the one who laid the foundations of the earth. And he brought out order from chaos while the angels shouted for joy. He told the raging waters to be still and the oceans that you will come this far and you will come no further. He commanded the morning to appear and he fills the world with light and with color. He maintains the storehouses of snow and he makes the rain to fall. He directs the movement of the stars. He's the source of wisdom, the wellspring of goodness, the arbiter of justice. Look, he's the one who is all-knowing, the author of life. He's all-present, all-powerful, all-loving. Nothing stops him, nothing confounds him, nothing scares him, and nothing is beyond his reach. His protection is available. His faithfulness, unfathomable. His patience, it's impenetrable. His compassion is incomparable. His mercy never runs dry. His favor never fails. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Listen, the earth shakes at the sound of his voice. Enemies fall faint at the sight of his strong right hand. His name is holy. His will is history. His plans are the future. And so we can trust him. We can follow him. We can lean into him. His is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever and ever. And we say what? Amen. Amen. And you know what that means? It means you're going to be okay. It means you're going to be okay doesn't mean you won't suffer doesn't mean tragedies won't happen doesn't mean life won't be unbearably hard but it means you're gonna be okay and I'm gonna be okay because he is our father and we can lean into him oh you bow and pray with me God I thank you for your love thank you that prayer unlocks this unfair advantage we have knowing you and serving you we pray you move and work in our life we pray you move and work in our family and in our homes. And God, we pray for a miracle as we follow you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.